stand back up here where you can see it just so the camera can We're live? Okay, well, hey, I apologize for the technical difficulties for you guys who are joining us on Facebook and YouTube. Welcome to the Shift Church. We're not just watching a live stream, we are attending church together. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Alan. I'm the pastor of youth ministry here at the Shift. And I just wanna say, it's kind of cool that we are all attending church in different parts of our city. Some of you are sitting in living rooms in South Albany or in North Albany or West Albany. Some of you are, are attending with people in your living room or bedroom or office, you know, out in Lebanon or, or out in Halsey or Brownsville or even different parts of the state or the United States. And so I think it's just kind of cool that we're all attending together. If you're just joining us, last week we jumped into a series we started a year ago called uh, The Gospel of Luke, An Introduction to Hope. And in this series, why it's messaged and titled An Introduction to Hope is because one of the main themes in the book of Luke is that when people meet hope, when they meet Jesus, our hope, their lives are radically transformed. And so this week, we're jumping back into it. We jumped into it last week, and we're going to continue on, and we're going to pick it up in Luke 9. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, turn with me to Luke chapter 9. We're going to be in verse 37. And while you're turning there, I'll just give a shout out to um, some of my college students who are, are attending church via live stream. I see you. Uh, I miss having you here, but I'm glad that you are at your university. And I also want to give a shout out to some of my students who are watching. Um, they're going to be here later tonight for youth. And um, as the pastor of youth ministry, one of my primary goals and joys in life is seeing students conformed to the image of Jesus day in day out. Last week, we saw the transfiguration of Jesus, just to kind of set the scene a little bit. Jesus took his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, up um, into a mountain, and they saw a glimpse of Jesus' glorified state. And they saw um, a glimpse of what Jesus is going to look like when he returns to earth. And if you want a clearer picture on that, go to Revelation chapter 1. You'll see that um, the, his, his glorified state. And today's text is the day after the transfiguration. So Peter, James, and John, they see Jesus in his glorified state. They see Moses, they see Elijah, and then they come down the mountain and we pick it up in Luke 9, verse 37. So if you'll read it with me. It says, On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. In verse 43, and all were astonished at the majesty of God. Father, I just ask that in these next few moments, would you speak to us? I ask, Lord, that you would continue working, even through technical difficulties, even through kids running around, even through all that's happening in our world, Lord, speak to us. God, may I decrease and you increase. God, share your heart with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, if you remember from last year in um, the book of Luke, chapter 9, in verses 1 and 2, Jesus commissions his disciples to go and preach the kingdom of God and to heal people. Um, in verse 1 of chapter 9, it says this, And he called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And so I think it's pretty safe to assume for us that while um, the inner circle and Jesus are on the mountain, that his disciples most likely continued healing and proclaiming the kingdom while they were up there. And so what happens is Jesus and the inner three, the Peter, James, and John, they come down from the mountaintop and they're immediately confronted with the brokenness of this world. We see that here, that there is a boy who is demon-possessed. And so they come from the mountaintop and they immediately are confronted with the brokenness of this world. And what I want to do for us is unpack three things that hope does for us in a broken world. The first is this. Hope allows us to look on others with mercy and care. 
Hope allows us to look on others with mercy and care. Let's read verses 38 and 39 again. It says, and behold, a man from the crowd cried out, teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, the spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. Do you hear the brokenness of our world right there? Do you hear the desperation of a father? He's pleading with Jesus, please, like, look at my son. Like, do something. There's a spirit that throws him to the ground. It says that it shatters him and it hardly leaves him. This example of brokenness, it represents the brokenness that's in our world today. But what I want to turn your attention to is the word look that is used by the father in verse 38. He says to Jesus, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. This word look in the Greek is epiblebo, and it means to gaze upon or look upon with admiration or regard, and it's the idea that someone is looking upon someone else with pity or for the sake of helping or giving aid. And curiously enough, this word in the Greek is only used two other times. It's used in the book of James, and Mary uses it in um, the book of Luke when she's singing a song after she learns that she's gonna give birth to Jesus. And so we see it here in verse 46 of Luke 1, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in my Savior, for he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. What do we see right there is mercy and care. We see this man who's absolutely desperate. Like he is, he is desperate and he, he is crying out to Jesus to, to look upon his son with care and compassion and mercy and to do something. And he goes straight to Jesus. Why does he do that? Why does, why does Mary sing about the Lord? It's because that's where their hope is. Mary got it, this father got it, their hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. He is the hope that we have. Why is he our hope? Because he's our hope because he looked upon us with that compassion and with that mercy and saw us spiritually dead and decided to leave heaven and come to earth on a radical rescue mission to save us. Jesus is our hope because while he was on earth, he was tempted in every single way, but it was sinless so he could be the perfect substitution for us on the cross. Jesus is our hope because even though he was mocked and nailed to a cross and beaten, he endured the wrath of God for all of our sins, past, present, and future. He is our hope because even though he died and was buried in the tomb, three days later he resurrected from the grave and he is alive. He ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's ruling and reigning and preparing a place for us in eternity. Jesus is our hope because one day he will come back to earth again and our bodies will be made whole. We will be with our Savior forever. And so if you put your faith and trust in Jesus for who he is, his sinless life, his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection, you have a new hope. You have a new hope that's solely found in Jesus. Our hope is not found in a vaccine. Our hope is not found in a political candidate or a political party. Our hope is not in our GPA that we hope to earn or our retirement plan that we're putting money into. Our hope is not in things reopening and not wearing masks anymore. Our hope is solely in Jesus, our Savior. And I think a lot of us, we stop right there because we, we say, yep, that's it, that's it, I got it, I believe that but we have to let the word of God transform who we are. And we have to apply the word of God to our lives. You see this desperate father, he begs Jesus, just look at my son. And Jesus does, he looks at him with care and compassion and mercy. But what do we do? What do we do? Do we look at others with that compassion, with that mercy, with that, with that sake to give aid and to help? No, we don't. I know some of you are thinking, well, no, that's not quite right, Alan. I was at the Expo Center, I was at the fairgrounds, I helped with the fires, I donated to charity, and that is awesome. And I love that about our church, that we were ready to do that. 
But natural disasters come every so often. What about the mundane every day of life? What about the people that you see every day? What about the people that's in your neighborhoods, your work, your schools? What about that person that you really don't like and don't get along with? You see, what, what happens to us is that we, we, will accept, we will accept the merciful gaze of our Savior, but then we have trouble looking at others with that same mercy. And for some of us, man, we have this beef or grudge with somebody, and it was like months or years ago, and we still cannot look at them with mercy and compassion. Or maybe it's a friend of a friend that got wronged, and then because of that, you've canceled somebody, and cancel culture is wildly unbiblical. And for some of us, we simply judge, right? We look and evaluate what people post on social media and we hit snooze. We judge other people by their political beliefs or ideological beliefs. We judge people if they're gonna wear a mask or they don't wanna wear a mask. We judge people on appearance, how they dress, how they speak. For some of us, it goes even a little bit further. We'll be like, let's grab coffee. Like, let's grab dinner and we'll catch up. And then that person begins to unload their life story and unload what's happening. And then we kind of squirm, right? We're like, okay, how much longer? I gotta get home, I gotta feed the kids, I gotta put them to bed. So we change the subject. And we're leaving, we're like, yeah, let's do this again. And we get in the car and we're like, oh my gosh. And then we call someone who's like, you wouldn't believe what this person said. Do you see what happens with us? We, we, we accept that merciful gaze from our Savior, but just like toilet paper, we stock it up and we withhold it and we don't want to look at others with that same mercy and compassion and so our hearts begin to harden. And in a few weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna unpack the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10 and I don't wanna give anything away from that, but it's the story that there's this dying man, he's on the side of the road and so a priest walks by, and the priest, it says it see, he sees him, and he literally crosses the road and continues walking. And then the Levite comes and sees this dying man who's beaten, he's naked, and he crosses the road to walk by. But then a Samaritan, who's, who are hated by the Jews, walks by, and what does it say? It says in Luke 10, 33, he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. That's the posture of a heart that has hope in Jesus. That is the posture of a heart that's been redeemed. That's the posture of a Christian who uh, is di digging into scripture and God's word that they see people and they see them with compassion. But we're the priest. Like we are the Levite. We're so busy, we're so self-involved, we're in, in our phones, we don't even look up out of our Netflix stream to see who on our Zoom call is struggling or to know students, that there's some students in your school who can't do online school. They don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have the necessary tools to do that. That for some of you, that in your neighborhoods, there's people who've been laid off due to COVID, or who can't go to work, or are taking care of a loved one. There's people all around in our lives that we need to see. That's the first step, we see them with compassion and mercy, and then we apply it to our lives. See, we have to be people of the heart. We have to be people of the heart. If you struggle with this, let me turn your attention to 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord says to Samuel, do not look upon his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, we have to be people of the heart. We have to look past the exterior, past the offense. We have to look at the heart because let me tell you, church family, every person you encounter, every single person you encounter has a soul and is destined for heaven or hell. And so we have to look at others with the same compassion and same mercy that Jesus does for this father here. The second thing I wanna show you about hope in a broken world is that hope equips us to fight our enemy. Let's look back at the text in verse 40. The father continues on, he says, and I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. In verse 41, Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. I think many of us read that and we're like, 
Oh, Jesus, that's a little harsh. That's a little harsh. That's kind of mean, right? But what is Jesus doing here? Jesus is kindly reminding the disciples and the people around them that apart from Jesus, they cannot do anything. Because guess what? The disciples lacked faith. They did. They lacked faith. Instead, they misplaced the faith in themselves. They're like, well, guess what? I'm going to try to cast this demon out. I'm going to try to to rebuke this unclean spirit. And instead of placing their faith in Jesus, who commissioned them in verse 1 and 2 to go out and heal people, they placed their faith in themselves. But Jesus is reminding them that apart from him, they cannot do anything, and they cannot cast out demons. And we get a clearer picture. Mark, in the book of Mark, it expands on this story. In verse 28, after the same story is, is, happens, the disciples, they ask Jesus in private, why could we not cast it out? And in Mark 9, 29, he gives them the answer. He says, and he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So it's pretty clear the disciples didn't pray. They didn't recognize their need for Jesus and they try to rely on their own talent and their own gifts and their own merit to cast out a demon. And why is this important? What Luke is doing in the text this morning is he's reminding us that we have a true enemy. Luke is reminding us that we have a true enemy out there. And I know right now in this highly, highly tense and politicized climate, I think we are fighting the wrong enemies and we are mislabeling enemies. Because for some of us, we think one of the enemies is a political party. For some of us, we think the enemy is those who are protesting or those who are rioting and looting. For others, we think the enemy are people who are telling people to wear a mask or people who aren't. Or we believe that the enemy is people who don't believe in global warming or maybe who don't believe in recycling. Or for some of us, the enemy is a country on this planet that we're so against. But what we see in the text this morning is the true enemy is not any of those things. It's Satan. It's the devil. That's the true enemy. In 1 Peter 5, 8, the enemy, Satan, is described as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And in John 8, 44, he's described as the father of lies. This is our one true enemy. This is who we're fighting against. Paul recognizes this in Ephesians 6, 12. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is our enemy. And like the disciples, we cannot defeat our enemy on our own. We can't. I think some of us, we, we take on this Rocky Balboa moment. We're like, yep, we're going to go 15 rounds, right? We're going to prove that we're not a bum, but we cannot do that. We cannot fight the enemy on our own. Because right now, the, the enemy is at war against us. Satan is at war against us. He is the father of lies, which means he has a PhD in deception. And he's lying to us right now. Right now, we live in a society that's so distracted. We have every single streaming service available. We've got iPhones, and we've got computers. We've got multiple computers, and we've got iPads. And, and we are so consumed by work and sports and schedule. And so we backlog, and we fill our schedule up. And we find things to distract ourselves. But church family, we have to wake up. We have to wake up. Because do you realize what's happening here? Who is demon-possessed? It's a boy. In the Greek, it's this, uh, the, it's, the term is used as for someone who's in kind of elementary school. And so why are Shannon and I so passionate about students being discipled? It's because the devil shows no partiality. He doesn't care if you're a kid or an adult or an elderly person. The devil does not care if you're a boy or a girl. He doesn't care if you're a baby Christian or you're a seasoned veteran in the faith. The devil is at war against us. And bless the disciples, bless their heart. They thought they could do it. They thought they could do it without Jesus. But Paul in 1 Corinthians, he recognizes this when he's writing this letter to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So how do we fight, according to Paul? 
How do we fight according to Jesus? We pray, we fast, we dig in to scripture, we, we belong to community, we worship, we repent of our sins, we serve others, we share the gospel. That's how we fight against the true enemy. That's how we do it. And I know so, for many of us who are watching, I'm like this too, we are, we are action-minded, like we wanna do something. Like, like we're, we wanna do something, like we're gonna vote. Like we wanna, we wanna do something tangible physically to fight against the enemy. But before we vote, or before we protest, or before we share something on social media, before we try to convince somebody that our view is right and their view is wrong, what I would encourage you to do is go to the gospel first and have a gospel mindset. If you're, if you're attending church today and you've been struggling with sin, no, the answer is not to muscle through and try harder. The answer is to dig in and allow God's spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, who conquered sin, then conquer the sin in your life. You cannot be a witness in God's kingdom with your own words. You have to share the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Apart from God, you can do nothing. And I know we have like a month and a couple of days, I think, till the election. And some of you, like you're dead set on voting. Like, I'm gonna vote. I know who I'm gonna vote for. And I love that. Because I, I, I encourage you, vote if you can. It's a privilege. But what I want to tell you is this. Pray, do. Pray. And what I would ask you, church family, is just as you're committed to voting this election, would you show the same commitment towards prayer? Would you show the same commitment towards reading your Bible? Would you show the same commitment to fasting and to being in community and serving and loving on others? Because honestly, if you vote but you don't pray, enemy's gonna win. We have to wage war against the enemy and we don't use the tools of this world. We don't use the tools of this world. The third thing we see that hope does is hope directs our attention and our worship. Let's go ahead and conclude and we'll read the last few verses. It says, while he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all who were astonished at the majesty of God, all and all were astonished at the majesty of God. We conclude today's text. We see Jesus, he rebukes the demonic spirit, he heals the boy, and then he restores the family. He restores him to his father. That's what we see that's a perfect picture of the gospel. Jesus comes to us, we're afflicted, we're broken, we're suffering, and he redeems and restores us into the family of God. And I wanna turn your attention to the word astonished because I think we can read these last few verses and just kind of blow, blow over it. The word astonished in the Greek, it literally means to be struck out of one's senses. It's this idea that you are so amazed. You're so overwhelmed by what you're seeing and, and hearing and experiencing. You're struck out of your senses. And that's what's happening with the people here. They see what happens. They see Jesus heal that boy, and they're filled with amazement that they're overwhelmed. My question for us today, church family, is are we astonished at the majesty of Jesus Christ? Are we amazed with God? Are we overwhelmed to the point of being struck out of our senses? I think for some of us, we're following the wrong Jesus. Because what we see over and over again in the book of Luke is when people get a clear view of who Jesus is, their lives radically change. Right, you see it, the disciples, Jesus says, come follow me, and they're like, I, I, I guess I gotta follow him. And they, when they meet Jesus, their lives radically change and they're mesmerized by God. And I think for a lot of us, when we initially became believers, we had that or when we're at a conference or a retreat or even a Sunday morning, we have those moments, right? But if you remember, they're not on the mountaintop. They've come down from the mountaintop and they're in the valley, they're in the mundane of life and they're mesmerized by Jesus. They're astonished by who he is. For many of us, we've grown bored with Jesus. We find it difficult to open our Bibles. We find it difficult to pray. We have no desire to spend time with Jesus. It's because you're following the wrong Jesus. You are. And so what I wanna do just for a few quick minutes before we jump into worship is calibrate us a moment. Because I wanna show you the Jesus that 
we are following. If you go back in the book of Luke, Jesus starts his earthly ministry in Luke chapter four. And I'm just gonna unpack what we see. In Luke four, Jesus casts out an unclean demon from a man by speaking to it. And then he heals various people of sickness and disease. In Luke five, Jesus heals a man with leprosy and then he heals a man who's paralyzed. Like full health. And then in Luke 6, we see this man with a withered hand, right hand, he can't use it, and Jesus heals him. And then we see a great multitude come, and Jesus teaches them and heals them of diseases and unclean spirits. And then in Luke 7, there's this man who's at the point of death at another house, and Jesus just speaks the words, and he's healed. The guy's not even in the presence of Jesus. Jesus speaks, and he's healed. Later on, he speaks to a dead man and raises him from death to life death to life. And then towards the end of Luke 7, we see Jesus forgive a woman of her sins. And then in Luke 8, Jesus is asleep on the boat with his disciples, and it's storming and water's coming in, and then he calms the storm on the lake. The same chapter, there's a man who's possessed by demons, plural. Jesus casts them out. This guy, like he breaks chains, like handcuffs and shackles, he breaks it, Jesus heals him. And then later on, we see that a woman has this blood disease and she just touches Jesus' shirt and she's healed instantly. And then we see at the end of Luke 8, there's this 12-year-old girl who is sick and then she dies and Jesus resurrects her from death to life. And then in Luke 9, Jesus sends his his disciples out to heal and to preach the kingdom and then he feeds over 5,000 people with five loaves and two pieces of fish. Over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And then the transfiguration, we get a glimpse of Jesus in his glorified state with Moses and Elijah. That is the Jesus that we follow. That's the Jesus that has everybody astonished and struck out of their senses. And then if you go a couple chapters later, Jesus is beaten. He's nailed to a cross. The the wrath of God is poured out on him. He dies. He's buried in a tomb. Three days later, he rises from the grave and he ascends to heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. That's our Jesus. If you're bored with God or you have difficulty spending time with God or, or you just think that God is kind of just, doesn't really matter, you're following the wrong Jesus, church family. This is the Jesus we follow. I know right now in this day and age we're captivated by movies and Netflix and Disney Plus and TikTok and YouTube and we're, we're, we are blown away by musicians. Like I'm, I'm really excited for the next season of The Mandalorian. Like I'm super pumped. I'm really excited. But then I sat this week and realized I'm more excited about the season two of The Mandalorian than I am of Jesus' second coming. I'm more mesmerized by a Disney Plus show than the God who can raise people from death to life. For my students who are watching, you're going to learn about people this year. You're going to learn about people like Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Edison and Isaac Newton. Those are great people. They invented great things. They did great things. You're going to read books from different authors who are bestsellers on New York Times and famous people you're going to learn about like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Genghis Khan. But students who are listening right now, let me tell you, do not be mesmerized by somebody who is dead. Jesus is alive. We see it in the scriptures. He resurrects from the grave and he's ruling and reigning and he's at work right now. Do not let yourself be more captivated by somebody who is dead than a God who is alive right now. For some of you right now, we're watching the NBA playoffs. Like these athletes are incredible. We're watching college football. My alum, my alma mater won yesterday. Praise the God. Um, we're mesmerized by people like Elon Musk. We're mesmerized and we're captivated by these people. But remember, those athletes, those CEOs, those TikTok video creators, those people on YouTube were made by Jesus and for Jesus. And so you think they're creative, you think they're mesmerizing, how much more mesmerizing is our Savior then, who created them for himself? Do not let yourself be mesmerized by social media entertainment when we can see Jesus clearly. Jesus, who was and is God, is alive and he's ruling and reigning. And so maybe the question that I have for you this morning 
is do you have just informational knowledge of who Jesus is? Like where he was born, how long he lived? Or do you have experiential knowledge that Jesus came from heaven to earth? He put on humanity. He humbled himself. He served us, and instead of celebrating him as a king, we crucified him as a criminal, and he endured the wrath of God on our behalf so that all of our sins, past, present, future, can be forgiven. Do you have experience with that Jesus? And so I invite you, churchgoer, church family, or unbeliever, or person who is doubting, come experience this Jesus. Come experience this Jesus. I promise you, when you see Jesus clearly, you will be struck out of your senses and you'll be astonished and mesmerized by this Jesus. So what? Oh, thank you, Alan. Um, Alan made three, three big points about hope. It allows us to look upon others with mercy and care. Hope equips us to fight the enemy, and hope directs our attention and our worship. I hope you caught those, and I hope you uh, just make those real in your life. Uh, have you ever had one of those mountaintop experiences? Uh, one of those moments where you're just absolutely transported into the presence of God or he reaches into your life in a way that is new and exciting and has, has just empowered you in something that you never experienced before. And you have this feeling like everything has changed and everything is better and everything's going to be amazing. And then you walk down the mountain and you step in the doo-doo of life. And... Peter and James and John, following Jesus, walked down from the mountain. From, from seeing Jesus transfigured, for crying out loud, he's having a strategic planning session with Elijah and Moses. And then you step into the doo-doo of life, real life. Life where people are hurting. Life where people need care. Life where people perhaps don't know the Jesus who can save them as Alan described so clearly. A couple of things came out of this for me as I was studying it and listening to Alan. The first one was this. We are, by nature, especially us guys, fixers. And when things break, or when things go wrong, or when something's not what we think it should be, we try to fix it. We do everything we can. We, you know, think of this father, think of this man, his only child, his only son, possessed by demon that throws him into epileptic fits and he cannot control it. And the man's probably been to every authority he can probably find to try and get something done for his son, but he can't find anything. He goes to Jesus' disciples, the ones who are still on the, in the valley there, who weren't on the mountain with, with Christ, and, and they say, here, do this, you can do this. And they can't. And they want to very badly. I mean, the scribes are standing there absolutely ridiculing them for their failure. And probably the crowd is starting to jeer at them quite a bit too. And then Jesus steps into the scene. In fact, in, in Mark's gospel, we read that everyone was amazed, astonished that Jesus even appeared. It was as though he kind of wasn't there and now he was there. But he stepped into the middle of this and Jesus fixes the situation. The father doesn't. I mean, gosh, I understand this man's, this man's terror at the condition of his son. I was seven years old. Uh, I was at my grandparents' house in uh, Vida. Now there's a memory that is probably gone, but we're playing uh, catch with a football. I ball went into some brush and I ran into the brush to get it and I was probably about seven years old and I tripped and I fell and there was a broken beer bottle and it gashed my knee open severely. Uh, I have the scar to remember it. And I remember that uh, they bundled me up and wrapped me my, my knee up in towels and I think this is when the speed limit was 70 all everywhere 
and I know that my dad exceeded that ex you know, significantly as he drove me to Mackenzie Willamette. He was doing anything he could. This was his son, and his son was in trouble. I understand this father. And so when Jesus shows up on the scene, he goes straight to Jesus and says, if you can. And Jesus says to him, if I can. If you believe anything's possible. And the man does, in, in Mark's gospel, he's recorded as saying, I, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now there's transparency and honesty. So the first thing I, I picked up for myself is, I can't fix everything. Jesus is who fixes things. And he, and he calls me to believe. And he calls me to be honest when my belief is weak. The second thing, and, and it's, it comes from Alan's first point, that, that hope, Jesus, allows us to look upon others with mercy and care. Who do you love? I mean, who do you truly, deeply love? How far would you go? How much would you spend? How, how difficult a task would you take on for that person you love? Or perhaps there's a thing that you love. How much will you spend to keep that, to protect it, to, to make sure that no one takes it away from you or that, that it doesn't break? Who do you love? What do you love? As Alan told us so clearly, the one we should love is the one who loves us with an unending, unlimited, unbounded love, and that is Jesus. First thing, I can't fix everything, and neither can you. But the one who we love, the Jesus who loves us, is the one who makes things right in our lives. So we trust him, even in the weakness of our faith, we trust him to do that. We're going to continue and respond in worship to this word that we received today. We believe that God speaks through his, his servants like Alan to, to bring us ever closer into deeper relationships. So we want to worship him for the gift of the message that he has brought us today. But we want also want to worship God for just who he is because he deserves that simply because he is God. The band's going to play a couple of more songs. We'll sing and worship. I hope you're singing at home, wherever you are, uh, and worshiping with us. If you have the elements for communion handy, grape juice and maybe a dinner roll or whatever you have, uh, take communion together if, as a family, if you're as a family. If not, take it yourself alone. Remember the price that was paid for your life and the love that was poured out on the cross to save your soul. We also worship through giving, and while we're not in person here where we can uh, pass the uh, cigar boxes and, and put our offering in, yet I strongly encourage you, please, show your worship through your giving. Do it generously. Do it sacrificially. Do it faithfully. Do it regularly. Let's worship God together. Pray with me. Father, Indeed, in Jesus, your Son, you have given us hope, the only hope that can truly save us. We thank you, God, for that. We thank you that you reach into our lives with hope and you renew us. You make us brand new into what you desire us to be. Holy Spirit, help us be surrendered to what God wants to do in our lives, to everything that he desires and exactly who we, he wants us to be. Jesus, we pray to, that we would keep you directly in our focus, that we would not look to the left or to the right, but that our eyes would be fixed upon you in your glory. God, we honor you. We love you. We worship you. In the name of Christ Jesus, your Son and our Savior. Amen.
in my sorrow when dead in my sin Lost without hope but no place to begin And your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested I began Ash was redeemed Only beauty remains My orphan heart Was given displayed on a criminal's cross darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with a
Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for um, speaking through your, our brother Alan. Lord God, thank you for uh, using all that were involved with leading worship and running video and sound and all. Lord, today, God, just thank you um, that you have glorified yourself uh, through us. And Lord God, you've taught us through your word. We, we thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. A uh, couple of real quick announcements, well, actually like four. Um, October the 11th, we begin indoor church. If you haven't went to the website and, and taken a look at the, the reopening plan and the guidelines for that, we'd encourage you to go check that out. Really excited about the fact that we're going to be able to start getting back in here and worshiping together. Um, the next thing is uh, Shift Youth Family Night is, has been rescheduled to October the 4th. Uh, Kona Ice at 530 Games and Families All Invited. So that's next Sunday, October 4th. Also, Shift Women's Bible Study starts the following Monday on October 5th. Um, and so it's going to be entirely online. The, the Fall Women's Bible Study is going to be entirely online. Uh, it's a new adventure for all of us to try to figure that out. You should have gotten an email. If we had your, if we had your email address, you should have gotten an email to give details about signing up. Uh, lastly, the uh, Shift Kids resources are all posted online. Uh, as well as through social media, um, all of our different social media outlets for Shift Kids. Uh, also, this coming Friday night for Shift Kids, we have family movie night. So uh, come check that out. There's going to be uh, Kona Ice there as well. Um, and a lot of opportunities for us to start beginning to connect and gather again. Of course, we will uh, be careful and do all the things that we need to do. But uh, look forward to the opportunities to see some of you again soon. Uh, looking forward to indoor worship together in person. Uh, and so just hope you have a great week. God bless. See ya.